All right, everyone, Donald Trump wished Maxine Waters a happy birthday a couple days ago and then said, oh, happy birthday to the leader of the Democratic Party. And, and it was amusing, but it's also a good strategy. Here's the thing. One of the reasons the Democratic Party suffered like in 2016 is who was the symbol of their party? It was Hillary Clinton. What was Hillary Clinton known for among people who weren't partisans? Like if you were a Trump loyalist, you know, you just thought she was the devil. If you were a Democratic partisan, you thought she was quite virtuous. She was standing up against Hitler, literally. If you were in the middle, if you were an independent voter like myself or you know, like nonpartisan, apolitical, you probably saw her as a, a fairly vague, muddled candidate. She really didn't form a, a coherent platform. And she was obviously she, old, like in the most literal sense, physically unwell. And I think that made just enough people nervous so that she didn't get elected. Also, someone who called tens of millions of people deplorable, but of course, uh, that's only the bigots, you know, <laughs> only half of Trump supporters, you know, basically, <laughs> a fifth of the fucking country's popula voting population or something, which is really funny. And therefore, uh, here's the, the principle. You want the symbol, the face of a political party that you oppose to be unhinged in the most literal sense. There are few people that rival the level to which Maxine Waters is at, but there are others that are trying. Cuomo definitely with his gaffe, and then he tries to explain what he actually meant, and he failed again. So basically, I don't know what the dude's thinking. I'm thinking he had a senior moment or something. You've got Ocasio-Cortez, who bans the press from her town halls and, and isn't looking very good right now, uh, probably has some, some deep political problems very quickly. Um, you've got people like Pelosi, but Pelosi is sort of an afterthought now. And then you have like a Feinstein, same thing. Like this is her last hurrah. She's going to die in office as a perennial candidate. It's obvious. She's like, what, 84, some crazy shit. Uh, and you've got all these different people. And these are the people you want your party to be known for. At this part, that, that's why Trump never attacks Gillibrand. By the way, he's, he selects uh, his opponents, essentially. And the Democrats do the same. He's not going to insult or berate or even talk about, whenever possible, anyone he thinks would be a more viable uh, opponent for him. Gillibrand thus escapes any ire. Uh, he doesn't talk much about some of the lesser known people who, who could shoot to the top of a 2020 ticket and supplant maybe the people he'd rather run against. He'd rather run against somebody like Joe Biden. He want, he'd love to run against Hillary again. Joe Biden, uh, and Al Franken, he wants that to be the face of the party. People like Ocasio-Cortez, Maxine Waters, Kamala Harris, the unhinged people on the left, he talks about them constantly. It's not just reactive, it's also an attempt to push the Democrats in certain directions by making it look like he, it's, it's a double whammy. In one sense, you drain attention away from, from people that may be more worth a second thought about voting for, like a Gillibrand, someone who's at the very least kind of sane. And at the same time that you're starving them of oxygen, uh, you're also causing the rest of the entire party to have to choose, is this someone I'm going to stand behind? Uh, and you're trying to as well, the more irate Democrats, the, the sort of hashtag resist people, they're, they're, it's reverse psychology on them because basically, you know, if he attacks Joe Biden, they'll be like, oh, we must defend Joe. And so then obviously makes it more likely he's going to have more support. So if you look at the people that Trump focuses his fire on, it's not even necessarily a sampling of just who's really out there. It's a sampling of who he would rather run against. That's his entire operative strategy and will be until 2020. He'll attack Elizabeth Warren because he knows she'll, she'll if she runs, she loses. She can't win. Look, even the lamestream media looking at her reform the capitalism act or whatever the fuck it's called. They're like, this isn't going to reform anything. It's, it's <laughs> short sighted and it's actually socialism. So we're not sure what she's trying to accomplish. In the last few days, the legacy media has managed to actually be kind of fair about both Elizabeth Warren and Ocasio-Cortez. Now, part of it is they're running interference for the Gillibrands of the party. I can guarantee you there is collusion and coordination. They're trying to fire on the progressive left to drain their support because you've got to remember, those same largely progressive and very young anti-Trumpers love the media. They, love, they actually love the corporate media. They trust everything they say. So if they criticize Elizabeth Warren, it makes it more likely that some missing link candidate can spring up a Gillibrand, uh, even, even maybe sort of a Kamala Harris, uh, certainly a Joe Biden, uh, and, and take their place as the, the candidate for 2020. So it's very, very interesting to see what's happening here. And Trump knows that. Trump knows that, which is why he keeps attacking the press. 
He knows uh, anyone who still supports him after he calls them fake news for a year isn't going to care if he does it one more time. At the same time, he forces the Democrats to keep listening to the press, knowing that they will make stupid mistakes and amalgamate around a shitty candidate that'll be easier for him to destroy, as opposed to someone who's actually on the left. Now, Maxine Waters, you'll remember, is the individual who said, oh yeah, don't give anyone who works with the Trump admin a moment's rest. Confront them in restaurants and on the street. Basically harass and stalk them. That's what Maxine Waters... Some people thought she would run for the presidency. I'm sitting there laughing my ass off, thinking anyone could think she's viable. But then I remember there were people who told me Ben Carson or Jeb Bush would likely be the next president. Like that one remote... I can't remember his name, but that one dude who does remote viewing, he's like, oh, I've already seen the meeting with the Bilderbergs and everyone else. Jeb Bush has already been nominated by the Republicans. They will destroy everyone else one by one. He will be the next president of the United States. Didn't even come in third in South Carolina, did he? Or, or I think he did come in third, and that was his best showing, and then he just collapses out of existence. By Nevada, nobody gave a fuck who Jeb Bush was. So remember, when people are making political predictions, look at their past predictions. Were they accurate or were they not? Like Nate Silver, he wants to be taken seriously on his midterm predictions. It's like, okay, maybe you're right. But, you know, a lot of people are going to shy away from looking at your metrics based on 2016. He has the Democrats taking, like, the lead in the House by seven seats. Uh, I'm not sure that that's true. It's possible, though. We'll have to wait for more polling. we got to see about the effect in August as the Senate is not in recess and the effect it has there, too. He doesn't even have a Senate forecast map. I don't, I don't know why. Could it be because he expects the Republicans to gain two or three seats in the Senate? Thus, it's not really a blue wave? Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't want to demoralize his, uh, his chosen party, which is obviously the Democratic Party at this point. Now, Trump is wise to do this. It's a good campaign strategy, and it's multifaceted. This is pure Trump, the way that he's doing this. Force the, the progressives to amalgamate behind the media while browbeating candidates you'd rather run against so that the media and those people come to their defense uh, thus drowning out all of the maybe more viable voices within the whole Democratic Party. Some of the never-Trump Republicans, by the way, I don't think that they fully understand this strategy. They think that what he's doing is a bad idea. Like, oh, you're alienating us, making us look bad. At any given time, he can be conciliatory. He's already done it before. And when he does that after prolonged bouts of insulting everything that moves, people tend to solidify behind him. Score fans don't care. They just want him to jab Warren once in a while. Remember when people were so outraged the first time he called Elizabeth Warren Pocahontas while he was, <laughs> while he was campaigning? With the last time he called her that, what was the reaction when he mentioned that at his rally? Nobody cared. Nobody gives a fuck anymore. It's totally normalized, which is exactly what he wants. And it's going to continue. A, a handful of irate Democratic partisans that would never vote for him to begin with, he doesn't care about campaigning for their votes, and they're the only ones that care that he's brash. At this point, people more often, I think, care about the economy and foreign policy. That and, and you know, internal cohesion within the Republican Party. By the way... All this shit about differential turnout really doesn't matter. We're talking right now about primaries and not the general. Where, how does that have anything to do with the general election when all of these different races will be happening on the same day? It doesn't really have much to do with it. <laughs> so, and some of these people running unopposed, it's like, yes, there's high Democratic turnout for this candidate who has no opponent. I wonder fucking why. That's about all. Peace out.